morning, Jeff. We're live, Chen. Good morning. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this sixth session of detailed scrutiny into the County Council's integrated plan, um, the IP. Um, I'm Sandy Walkington. I am County Councillor for the St Albans South Division of Hertfordshire County Council. I'm also Vice Chair of Overview and Scrutiny, and I am chairing this session this morning. I'll ask um, each of my colleagues to introduce themselves when they um, speak for the first time. Just to explain that we um, this is going to be a game of two halves because the area we're looking at is public health and community safety, and we will start with public health and then move on in the second part of the um, evidence gathering session to the community safety and fire service aspect. And the way it's worked is that I and my fellow members of the scrutiny committee have met beforehand, looked at the paperwork, looked at the numbers and come up with particular lines of in inquiry called key lines of inquiry. And that is what will guide our session this morning. But first of all, I will welcome Councillor Morris Bright, who is the um, portfolio holder for this area and his deputy, Rena Ranger. And I will invite Morris to say a few succinct words about the public health aspect of um, his responsibility, perhaps concentrating on one, one success, one challenge and one risk. And just assume that we do know what public health does. So Morris, over to you for a brief introduction. You're silent, Morris, you're muted. Uh, thank you to everyone here uh, on this uh, Monday morning and thank you very much indeed for inviting me to attend the scrutiny session. Uh, public health obviously covers several areas. I'm not going to go through them as you know them, but I will just list uh, within the three minutes a couple of successes and the challenges and some risks that we face. We can take more content about that. So the winter campaign to provide uh, flu jabs to our staff in Hertfordshire County Council. We've had the best ever uptake. 800 members of staff have delivered that. Um, we've had our joint uh, strategic needs assessment team working with the HCC Human Resources to identify staff risks and resignations, uh, staff sickness and resignations, and that I'm sure will become part of questions later on about resilience in the workforce. Uh, first half of the year was 4,000 people referred into our weight management programmes. This year we put additional funding into our Healthy Hubs partnership with district and borough councils to help address the impact of increased health inequalities which were identified during the pandemic. Around 4,000 people have been supported by our drugs and alcohol services this year, and that helps to keep crime down and prevent escalation into children, <coughs> excuse me, and family services. Uh, I think the epidemiology team has been working with Hertfordshire Partnership Foundation Trust to help make better use of mental health uh, data in support of inequalities and wider determinants of health. We've also been working with adult social care to identify opportunities for delivering better care for those with learning disabilities and we've had software developed by the team during the pandemic to be adapted now for other uses including coordinating responses to suicides and facilitating the homes for ukraine work stream um, so we've had quite a few successes uh, there are always challenges though and in, including the understanding of the impact of covid19 which may have struck us now th three years ago but uh, we're still feeling the uh, the, the repercussions and we need to understand the impact on the wider system and working with partners to address the health impacts. The uncertainty about access to COVID funding beyond 31st of March this year, 2023, uh, to continue to deal with the impacts of COVID, that's a challenge. Uh, this has been resolved now in the short term. We're pleased to report that we are able to give £100,000 each to each district and borough across Hertfordshire to deal with <clears throat> local health inequalities that they have identified. Uh, and we can use the remainder of our Hertfordshire wide schemes. Still a potential threat, <coughs> excuse me, from monkeypox and changes to staff terms and conditions through the Future Workforce Programme were unsettling and have prompted a number of resignations. So finally, just the two main risks, the uncertainty of future funding uh, and the potential additional asks uh, of all of us in terms of contributing to the predicted HCC budget gap in the future. That poses a risk to public health and our ability to plan and our clarity of common purpose and the direction from the newly formed ICS 
while it's still in its storming and norming phase, uh, requires a great deal of input from our public health senior officers. And we are working with Sarah Perman, uh, Hertfordshire County Council's ICC co ICS coordinator, to cooperate and achieve joint health income. So outcomes. So that's just a, a whistle stop to us, our successes, our challenges and our risks. Uh, Morris, <coughs> thank you very much. That was exceedingly succinct and um, I thank you for that. <coughs> so we'll move into the first of our key lines of inquiry, which is looking at the objective costs for the public health area. And Seamus Quilty is going to kick off on this one, but of course other people may want to come in as well. And Seamus, would you please introduce yourself? Uh, yes, um, thank you. My, my name is Seamus Quilty. I'm County Councillor for Bushy South Division. I've been on the County Council for a considerable number of years and uh, have uh, chaired uh, various scrutiny um, committees as well as different things. Now, what I would like to talk about, Morris, is the uh, projection of the corporate public health um, funding. If you look on page 115, top of page 115 you will see that uh, the first item is the this is, is 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 the corporate public health funding which which basically ensures the likes of covid um and funding for 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 those events like covid will be in place in the years come forward in the future years this at the, this year you have a budget of around about six uh, six million seven hundred thousand, but if you project that forward, it drops down to five million uh, five hundred thousand, and it, that's an extreme worry. We don't know what is going to be coming down the road, but should we be cutting budgets in relation to this particular item? Morris, you're silent still. Morris, you're muted. Do I get turned? Does someone turn me off every time I've finished speaking? Because it suddenly goes mute. So um, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. Um, uh, if you thank you, Seamus. Uh, if you're looking at the figures uh, that I've got in front of me here, the ones uh, on pages between pages one one three and one one seven. Um, are you talking specifically like the rate of inflation? And no, I'm talking about no, I'm talking about one. Uh, if you look at page one one five, the top of page one one five, there is an objective area which is the uh, corporate public health uh, and and uh, the, the the public health team works to improve the health and well-being of the people of Hertfordshire based on the best practice and best evidence. The corporate team provides the leadership and strategy. So basically, this is the budget for the whole of the corporate team. Now, it's it's running in the opposite direction that it should be. When you, you know, it's, it's if you take it, you know, never mind inflation, it's going down. Uh, this year it's at six, six million seven hundred thousand. That's a gross with a, well, it's a net figure as well, funny enough. That's a bit odd, but never mind. We've got a net figure of six hundred and, and uh, six, six, seven, five, four um, thousand, hundred thousand. And then if you project that forward to the year 2026, it comes down to five million five hundred thousand odd. Now that's a concern because what you're saying is the service is contracting; it's not even maintaining its 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 position. Joe, I, I'm, I think I'm. No, I'm, it's technical. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I think I'm understanding what he's saying. But Joe, do you just want to try and ascertain um, if course. we think you think you understand as well? We understand. Yeah. That. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the most of the cost um, on the corporate public health line is in relation to staff salaries. Um, we are looking to reduce the number of positions in public health somewhat because it grew exponentially over um, during COVID. Um, but it isn't too many posts. In actual fact, the reason why the numbers that the budget goes down so much is because we're also looking to uh, generate some income for some of the work that we do, and we anticipate that that will increase over the coming years. So, for example, David's team, David heads up our evidence and intelligence team. We provide data and intelligence support to outside organisations, other departments within um, within the county council and to the NHS. 
um, and we've been very successful in attracting uh, some generating some income to pay for those staff providing those services. Um, they see us as a centre of expertise in both evidence and intelligence and also um, our behavioural change unit. Um, and we're looking to uh, increase the amount of money that we can recharge for the provision of those services. And that's the reason why those staffing costs will be um, coming down. Is that OK, okay, okay so fine, that's about. fine. I'm sure it'll come out in other places in the uh, in, in, in the day to day. But you're saying you're reducing it's a firm reduction of staff. That's what you're saying that covers. There will, there will be a reduction of some posts, yeah, we, in, in line with um, trying to meet the county council's budget gap. Uh, you know, we've all had to make some sacrifices and we have put in place a vacancy freeze currently uh, to help us to manage that. We, we're not looking to make any redundancies at this stage, um, but we have been able to uh, reduce our staffing complement by just holding off on recruitment of, of some vacant posts. If I may come in there and just say, mm. I mean, it is nevertheless, the figures are flat going forward for the following um, one, two, three, four years. So assuming inflation does remain at a reasonable level, that is a continuing set of cuts. So what you're saying is that there's going to be a continuing reduction in staffing posts or some miraculous mm. income generation um, from the services that you provide, just to confirm. Yeah, yeah, that that is that is the case. However, I mean, we we're hoping that we will get an uplift in our in our public health grant next year, but that as yet hasn't been um, we haven't been informed of that. So um, it, it always comes in at kind of the eleventh hour, or even sometimes into the the new financial year that when we've already started it. So um, yeah, so we're not aware yet of any uplift at this time, but we will obviously cut our cloth accordingly and um, and make sure that we spend within our public health uh, ring fence grant. It's also, Sandy, if I can just interject, it's also worth mentioning that we commissioned many of our services on a flexible basis, um, because as Joe says, we were catering to a certain extent for the unknown during and after COVID. It is possible for us to vary our contracts at our end by plus or minus 10% uh, through contract variations. So yes, of course, we're being hit by inflation, at one side, but we can adapt our contracts accordingly. And we can also be looking for an, an inflationary uplift with suppliers in challenging times as well. So it's about staff and it's about negotiation um, so that even though the numbers aren't going upwards, um, there, there should not be a reduction in service where it's needed. I've Sandy, can I, can I just... Um, James, you have quick yeah, I just want to finish off that. Sunday. Shouldn't it be more clearer then in the actual um, paperwork that, that that particular item is about staffing costs? Well, I, we, that's up to officers to uh, uh, Joe. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, Joe. we we can take that on board. Yeah, we can we can make that clearer for next year. Apologies if it if it wasn't clear. That's it's similar wording to the wording we've always had in there, but um, it, it's it's helpful feedback. Thank you. We'll take that on board and yeah. make some changes. Thank Richard, you. have you taken your hand down now, Richard? Richard Fake, is it? Are you? Are yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about that, Chairman. I was uh, pressing the wrong button. Um, I, I'm, I'm just picking up very quickly on this because we 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 really don't want to get isolated on this particular item. Uh, but I I can see where you're going in terms of projecting uh, the expenditure forward. But there's no uh, concomitant um, projection of income going forward. We've only got the income or suggested income or, or suspected income for uh, a two million and uh, a two million six two point six. Yeah, two. Richard, you've gone muted. Yeah, sorry about that. It, it, it's it's playing up again. I did warn you I got problems. Um, I can see that you're carrying forward or at least projecting forward uh, the 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 expenditure from the uh, from from the department but i don't see any uh, projections forward for the income to offset the the differentials and i'm wondering if you're talking about making clarities for future future um ips whether or not uh, there ought to be projections for income so that we can actually correlate these but uh, i'll just make the point yeah and use the reserves as well i mean don't forget that we are going to be uh, using our reserves uh, to fill certain gaps in the next couple of years as well so um, I think Joe and um, David can take that on board. Right. Sunny, and then briefly, I think, so we keep moving. But Sunny, you've got an intervention to me. 
Yes, just on the comment made about um, the uplift that you will receive at some point, um, is that based on um, the county lobbying for money, i.e. saying we would like to provide these services, hence this is what we would like from the uplift, or is it a centralised uh, fund that gets received um, uh, throughout the country? Do you want me to answer that, Morris? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's um, yeah, it's it's centralised. We we don't really know what the what the grant will be until it is determined centrally, and then we are just notified of what it's going to be. And, and if you look at page um, one hundred and eight, you can see comparative figures um, how we compare Hertfordshire to the rest of England when it comes to uh, the funding that we do get in. And you can see that there are areas where I think in all areas where we're still below. What England gets as a national average and I think that the point that the leader of county council has made before was being such a large net contributor to the financial economy of the country um, it doesn't seem a two-way street but that's probably a conversation for another day but it's a bit frustrating when we have to fight so hard and in some cases we're getting half the money's coming through um, that other areas are getting that doesn't mean we've got it doesn't mean we've got the same amount of problems as elsewhere, say when it comes to drug, drugs and alcohol abuse. Um, so we don't necessarily need to have 100 percent. But around mental health, we're still getting below average child health, health, etc. So it, a bit of levelling up around that wouldn't go amiss. Well, Morris, you've just segued very neatly into the next key line of inquiry. Um, and uh, we have the next two, actually. First of all, um, Sunny uh, Tusu asking about um, public health comparison figures and Sunny if you introduce yourself and then ask your question and then Fiona's question actually follows quite closely as well but first of all Sunny. Uh, thank you Chair. Uh, yes uh, uh, Councillor Sunny Tusu representing uh, Holden's division in central uh, Welling Garden City um, and also sit on the public health uh, committee and almost like we rehearsed this Morris um, my question revolves around um, page 108 um, and effectively as you already described you know um, on all indicator categories we receive less than what England receives as a whole um, but having sat on the committee I do know that actually a lot of our performances against national um, guidance are quite strong and sometimes even above um, average so the question really is um, based on the fact that we continue to get um, less money per head of resident. Um, is this a positive thing that we managed to do this? And if if the purpose of public health service is to continually look to improve, shouldn't we be trying to, get, you know, we're being efficient by spending less, but if we got more, would we be able to provide better for our residences? Well, so, so thank you very much indeed, uh, Sonny, for the question. Well, we didn't rehearse it, otherwise I wouldn't have answered the question before you'd asked it. <laughs> so we didn't rehearse it very well. And look, the data shown in the table is 2019 data, right? Okay, it's pre-COVID. Pre-COVID started more or less this time three years ago, and it's the latest available figures from the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. Um, so it's not helpful. We need more up-to-date information. But based on what we have, there's a few changes. So, for example, we've created an in-house health protection function. Uh, we've invested more in mental health to deal with fallout from the pandemic. We've attracted some match funding from drug and alcohol services. Uh, the numbers in the table, they do represent spend on services. It doesn't take account of the strong team that we'd already built in, in public health. So as our strategy suggests, some of our most important activities requires working and influencing across the system so we get better health outcomes for the amount that we spend. And this takes good uh, influential people to do as well as services which you know that we have uh, yes it would be good to have more money to spend on health improvement but we tend to put our energy into working with partners to jointly fund certain aspects so for example the weight management that we jointly fund with the ccgs uh, the physical activity through the h uh, county council uh, health walks for example never too late campaign uh, daily mile in schools Again, that requires influencing rather than money. You can get to uh, reach objectives without having to spend a great deal. Uh, working with businesses in the workplace, health services, healthy hubs and so on. So uh, public health does aim to improve its, our residents' health in all those activities that we carry out and not just health improvement budget lines. Um, so in recent years, we've negotiated co-commissioning arrangements with the CCGs. That's enabled us to, health, uh, to maintain health improvement services such as uh, adult weight management at a consistent level while we share the cost with the NHS. Um, so, because uh, they stand to benefit as well. 
from their two-tier weight management services. So it's not quite as clear-cut as saying they get that amount, we should have exactly the same amount. We have learned to cut our cloth, uh, and we do know that by and large there are certain areas where we may not necessarily need the same amount to spend due to the concurrence of certain issues or the prevalence rather uh, of issues elsewhere that we don't necessarily have the same high quotient as. Tanya, do you want to add anything? Yes, if that's OK, just a, a few points. So um, I wasn't aware that this data was um, now coming up to almost four years out of date and we should perhaps um, comment on that and up to date data would be helpful. Um, perhaps a plea for further, you know, maybe next year or beyond. Um, national comparators um, are good and very interesting, but I know a lot of it does depend on uh, de uh, deprivation and yeah. Hertfordshire is rather high on not being a deprivated area, so it probably does receive less money. So perhaps comparators with say Buckinghamshire, Bedfordshire and Essex, um, but it, because we also we also um, share our health services with all those three areas as well. So it'd be interesting to see how we do with that. Um, but the final point is you made a comment, um, Morris, about how actually quite a lot of public health is delivered through partnerships and not necessarily uh, reflected in costs. But it was wondering how can we capture that? How do we capture that the partnerships we work with deliver all the things that we would like them to deliver that doesn't come that doesn't show up as a bottom line expenditure but more in terms of delivery of um, public health services is that for joe or david joe yeah? i can come in on that one um yeah i mean we have uh, you know, with lots of our partnership working, we have um, service level agreements in place, which uh, are, are which set out the public health outcomes that we anticipate coming from each of our different partnership arrangements. Um, as Morris said, we, we're looking more into uh, potentially uh, co-commissioning of services. We feel that we can pack more of a punch if we if we work together with the NHS. Um, and where, where and, and where we found common ground where everyone uh, see get looks to benefit from from that co-commissioning we found that those partnerships are extremely fruitful um the weight management uh, co-commissioning that Morris mentioned earlier is a good example of that where I think we we put in traditionally we put in uh, slightly less than a third of the cost uh, and then the, the two CCGs put in slightly more than that um, but it, everybody wins I mean where, where our budget was relatively small uh, in terms of tier two weight management services we're now, now able to provide something which is much more comprehensive much more uh, universal uh, for people across Hertfordshire to be able to access so I think it's about looking to uh, make those larger scale gains through that partnership working. It's, it's probably also worth saying as well, I think as Morris kind of um, hinted at earlier, we are working with, uh, you know, inevitably a, a limited budget and uh, public health sort of historically given the, you know, the scale and complexity of some of the problems that that we've got to deal with it's always been a, a challenge uh, you know what, what, whatever budget we're given but I think what we try to do is to punch above our weight by um, on top of all the services that we commission and some of that very visible stuff uh, that we spend money on a lot of what we do is is that influencing and advising and providing specialist input to other bits of the system both within the county council and the NHS and, and beyond so it's true that a lot a lot of that work is is perhaps less visible um because the things that we're influencing might be you know sort of badged as as, as being the, the domain of, of another um another bit of the system but you know we you know i guess i guess in terms of how do we um, communicate that i mean we we do sort of try and put out comms and newsletters and things to let people know what we're doing and, and where we're having an impact on the system. I think there's always potential for us to get better at that in terms of, of kind of banging our banging our drum and blowing our trumpet. Um, but but it's true. There's a there's a lot more that's work that that goes on um, to try and improve health outcomes beyond just that's kind of where the, the sort of very visible expenditure is. I've got John Hale um, Thank wanting you. to intervene. Yeah, I'm Councillor John Hale for Councillor for Cody Heath and Marshall Swick. A um, couple of observations on page 108, which is what Sunny has been talking about. The question is 
headed up as how has the portfolio reviewed its effectiveness value for money? And then we have a table that tells us how little we've spent, but there doesn't seem to be anything on here that tells us whether that's been, we spent a little and had equivalent low outcomes, or we spent a little and had very good outcomes. Um, now I see it comes from something called the spend and outcomes tool. Does that tell us anything about what our outcomes have been like and especially have how they compare to other areas? Yeah, would you like me to answer that? Yes, yes. We, 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 monitor, we monitor all of our activity against a national framework called public, the Public Health Outcomes Framework. So we're always comparing how Hertfordshire are doing with you know against against the amount of money that is spent and in comparison to other authorities unfortunately health is a very complex area where there isn't always a direct correlation between a, a scheme that we run or something that we do and the impact on that particular uh, health outcome because there are a number of uh, external variable factors that can also influence those things. So, um, so we do spend a lot of time evaluating the schemes that we put in place to try to uh, make sure that they are as effective as they can be uh, and we and we try to tweak those but we are as I mentioned we are also up against any number of other external factors that, that could be having an influence on people's health uh, preventive activities what's going on in that wider system if you're monitoring them isn't that why isn't there a paragraph or a table here saying how they're actually performing seeing as the question asks about effectiveness. Uh, OK, yeah, that's again, that's helpful feedback. We'll, we'll try and incorporate that for next year or we can follow up um, after the event with I, some I of that think, information. I think, Sandy, I would quite like that to be yes. an outcome. The, the question is effectiveness value for money and they haven't answered the exam question. I, I think, I, 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 you, I think that they have taken that on board. And I think that's and a very powerful you, message from all of us could, and you could uh, you could certainly include uh, the uh, the infographics that uh, are on the office for health improvement and disparities pages so for example i'm, I'm looking at it now uh, in relation to um Hertfordshire and public health um and in fact it's not just those it's it's they've got education social care etc housing the whole raft whole gamut from higher spend worse outcome to higher spend better outcome it would need some explanation but i don't see why i suppose if it's online people can click on but um it certainly might be worth including some data here, uh, Joanne, um, as as is on the site for those who were not, not able to access it and to explain it as well. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that would be very useful, Morris, because I've looked at it and on the screen I'm looking at, Hertfordshire is in higher spend, our worst outcome quadrant, but I may be misusing the tools, so it'd be useful to have an officer explanation of why we're there. Yeah, because right. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing more lower spend. Was it? Yes, I think they should. Let, I'll let them. Um, I'll let them um, um, uh, give an explanation. But it's certainly important to have that information, especially for those who aren't clicking onto the screen. But yes, please. David, did you want to be brief? I think we probably have worked this one to death. But did you want to say something quickly? <laughs> yes, very, very quickly. Um, I, I mean, it's a fair point. I think it's worth saying some of the, uh, you know, those, those tools can be can be a little bit sort of misleading because it can be a bit yeah. of a blunt tool. When we, uh, how we mostly try and evaluate what we're doing is with specific bespoke, uh, robust valuations of individual services and projects. And we built up quite a substantial evaluation uh, specialist team within the public health department over the last few years. And um, yeah, and we try and do as much of that robust sort of academically robust evaluation as we can. Uh, hard to capture that. Um, across the breadth of services that, that we deliver in terms of the, the findings of those evaluations, because it's often quite you know, lengthy and, and complex, but we do do a lot of that more robust work. Well, thank you. I mean, I think we're all left just a bit startled by the bald figures in that table on page 108. And, you know, in some cases we're getting less than 10% of what the average English spend is. And that does seem extraordinary, but I think we've, flog that one to death and we segue quite neatly into the next key line of inquiry which is going to be led by Fiona Guest looking at the public health grant. So Fiona over to you and please introduce yourself briefly before you ask your question. Thank you Chairman. I'm Fiona Guest. I'm County Councillor for Hemel Hempstead North West and I'm practising community pharmacist and my questions refer to the public health grant starting with how is the public health grant calculated 
So for example, does better performance mean a lower grant? Well, thank you very much indeed, Fiona. That's a, a very good question, how grants are calculated. Um, the amount of budget that we're allocated here in Hertfordshire is dependent on the levels of health in the region. So Hertfordshire is a relatively healthy county compared to many. So our funding isn't as great, but we do very good work with it and we tailor what we spend on the needs of our local population. Our ring fenced budget is around £50 million. Um, that's approximately £42 per head of population, whereas Blackpool, for example, gets around £134. That's three times as much per head of population. And the City of London gets £188 per head of population. That's 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 how it, that's how it's calculated. Yeah, no, you've got some more questions. I yes, I have. The, thank you for informing us, Morris, that the, the grant is calculated on the basis of need. And we've got a few more questions to ask, as the chairman says. So the public health grant that we're working with in the IP, it is an assumption, it is a forecast. So how confident can the service be in its forecasts of the incoming grants? And are the contingencies in place for if the anticipated budget increase of 2.05% doesn't happen? And conversely, if we get more grant than we're expecting, are there contingencies in place for how that's going to be used? Yes, again, very, very good questions, particularly at this uh, time, financial worry. Um, in so many different aspects and areas of everything that we do, as well as uh, other people across the country. Um, in the unlikely event that there's no increase at all in the 2023-24 public health grant drawdown, uh, a, a grant, we will draw down from public health reserves. Um, but as you know, you can only use reserves once. Um, and yes, we will cover off any sh funding shortfall for 23-24, but it starts getting more complicated if we then have to do that further down the line. Uh, if, we, if we do get a position where we get more, um, then I'm sure that we could we, we must find ways of using it. And uh, as you've already heard, there are areas we'd like to be spending more if there was more money, just to give us a little bit more balance with, with other areas. And I can be, I've, I've got officers nodding their heads saying, yes, we'll certainly be able to allocate that funding. Well, thank you. And my final question on this area is, how does the process of last minute yearly grant affect the efficiency of the service, say, for example, with multi year contracts? And what is the impact of this kind of, sort of stop fart start funding, so last minute funding when contracts are given out? Very good question, because it's actually incredibly difficult to plan. Uh, and one, that's one of the reasons where we, we attempt to maintain a healthy reserve, because then we can uh, react accordingly uh, in year if we need to. Um, we're, as a mainly commissioning service, it'd be extremely disruptive to the health system to continually adjust our provider services and health initiatives that usually need a number of years of stability to become embedded with GPs and members of the public. So we have the money come in and we, we, we look, we, we forward plan, if you like, just to ensure that there aren't too many bumps in the road and we can continue to provide the services across a period of time where you need those services to become embedded. Thank you. And in years when the grant is more accept is, is more than expected, <clears throat> is any of that put into reserve to cover for years when, when it is, is less than expected? I'm going to ask officers to answer that because I'm not sure whether or not we're allowed to. I, so, so it depends, I think, what the grant is for. Some have to be spent by a uh, time constraint. Uh, some maybe if you start the work, you can put what you've got left in to continue the work. Joe. Yeah, the, the public health ring fence grant, um, we are able to carry over if we don't um, if we if we don't spend it in year. So um, the, the way that we plan and the forecasts that I produce uh, usually have kind of like a worse anticipated uh, case scenario and, and a best. Uh, and we kind of can scale up our the services and the activities that we get involved in on the basis of both of those once we know what the funding is. So. Um, yeah, so so I think we uh, 
yeah, we go, and we certainly can. If if we if we do underspend in a year, then we can add that onto our reserve for future years, which is which is really helpful because uh, that isn't normally the case with county council funding. But because of the nature of the ring fence grant, which has to be spent on public health, uh, in line with a whole stack of criteria that we are provided, um, we are able to con contain that grant and, and carry it over for future years if we need to do that. Thank you. I've got Rich yeah. and Fake um, wanting yes, to speak. Thank you, Chairman. I didn't introduce myself last time, and I apologise for that. Uh, Richard Thake, member for Nebworth and Codicut, and uh, uh, been involved with community safety and various other directorates over a number of years. Um, I'm just quickly touching on this question of this short term um, last minute grant funding. Given the exceptionally high profile of our director of public health, Jim McManus, who I believe is first among equals in the country in terms of access to government, I take it that we and all of the other public health directors uh, are lobbying government for a more sensible approach to this. Certainly, uh, I, the, the very fact that, that you are able to uh, put un, unspent grant into a public health uh, reserve is useful, but the fact that you've got to use your reserves or, as a contingency to plan the work programmes that we want to deliver for the, our county when we best know what our county needs is is not really a very satisfactory way forward. Um, so perhaps you could comment. I'm, I'm sure Jim is, but uh, I, I'd be grateful if you could, could confirm my my hopes there. You, you do identify a, a very um, interesting conundrum there. Um, and, uh, you know, you're talking about the health of the people and you really shouldn't have to be trying to literally planning it year to year. You do need to let these things in bed. Jim, Jim, who very much, now that we're in session, um, he sends his deepest apologies. He's, he was bereaved very early hours of this morning. His mother passed away. He'd been in Scotland with her for a week or so, so he's not on the call. But um, yes, indeed, he is one of the, uh, the top epidemiologists across the country uh, and is well known for his uh, um, lobbying with others towards governments. And so we can get some consistency. Uh, Joe or David, in fact, would you like to clarify that? Yeah, I mean, Jim is Jim's also the um, president of the Association of Directors of Public Health, so he works with them to to lobby government around these type of issues and uh, and this is something that we've been complaining about for years it's very hard to plan uh, and, and operate a business when you really don't know for, you know from one year to the next what your funding is going to be particularly as as Morris said earlier as we're principally a commissioning services and lot and lots of our contracts run across a number of years you know it's uh, that we, we have to rely quite heavily on keeping that reserve in order to be able to know for sure that we're going to be to be able to meet those um those contractual obligations yes thank you very message, much for confirming that thank you thank you sandy i think the message that will come from this scrutiny is that we would endorse any lobbying to try and get a a more long-term stable approach to the funding of this area um, i think we've um boiled that one to death so we'll move on to the next um, key line of inquiry, which is going to be led by Sunny again, looking at issues around internal commissioning and efficiencies and any risks of clawback, which were mentioned in the IP papers as a risk. Sunny, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, yeah, almost distinctly put, really. Um, and we've already discussed um, how our internal commissioning system uh, works. Um, idea being that as we bring in more commissioning internally, um, we become more efficient when we're at risk of clawback and as a, as a consequence that could affect our grant income. So essentially, how do we ensure that doesn't happen? And do you have any examples where we have been successful in that area? Well, I'll give you, I'll, I'll, we'll divide this into two. Um, I'll give you a very quick answer to explain how we try not to do it. And I'll see if Joe uh, can come up with a with an idea of one uh, or two. So um, by making sure that the internal commissioning complies with the criteria that is specified in the ring fence grant, that's the sort of short answer of how we ensure we don't get it clawed back. Also, we, we monitor the overall all amount of internal commissioning uh, and that it doesn't require us to cut the core or statutory public health services, which we which would be considered um, as a health priority. It's, there are some odd hoops that we have to jump through if you think about it and you would know 
um, in, in, in the field that you're, you're, work, you're working yourself in hospitals and, and AHS. Um, but if that's the way that we have to do it and have to make sure we get the money and don't have to give it back, because it's nothing worse than being awarded money not and for public health and having to give it back, because surely that's a failure along the line. But our officers have got quite good at this. Joe, you might want to give a couple of examples. You might not. You might want to keep them private so we don't tell anyone how we do it. But, <laughs> Um, I, I mean, yeah, the, the, there are there are uh, many examples, and I think you know, again, Jim, David, and I regularly work through um, out in line with our funding forecasts that I um, referred to earlier in terms of kind of the best case and worst case scenarios and so on, and we are always you know continually prioritising. A sort of applying the prioritisation criteria that we that we have within our system to both the core aspects of public health that we deliver and also the things that we internally commission across the county council. Um, I think the, the the real driver for this is to be able to demonstrate that we are being able to um, demonstrate public health outcomes from any of the work that we are internally commissioning. Um, some of the some examples of some of the things that we are involved in, for example, we uh, we fund uh, the, I think a large portion of the county council's um, budget for domestic abuse. Clearly, there are public health outcomes to be to be to come from something like that because of the impact that domestic violence and abuse would have on something like your mental health, um, let alone your physical health. Um, we also uh, invest in things like Meals on Wheels, where we're making sure that elderly, frail people are making sure that, you know, they get decent uh, nutrition and hydration. Uh, we input into uh, children's and family centres, which is uh, a key platform for our delivery of also our, our health uh, health visitor services, which is one of our, our statutory requirements, one of our statutory services that we have to provide um, and engaging with young families and making sure that there's a, a a public area where people can bring their children for those health checks and those early developmental health checks and health screenings. So there are endless examples of, um, of some very positive work that, that we managed to achieve through uh, internal commissioning. And I do know that um, we do communicate with other uh, sort of peer peers, if you like, across uh, other public health and people do share intelligence and share ideas we learn from them and they learn from us and so there's, there's quite a symbiotic relationship with others we work well with other people and we've managed to avoid being slapped on the wrist and told you're being naughty and you're allowing the public health grant to be spent on non-public health matters we've 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 kept the right side of the boundary is what you're saying of course and particularly with me i would never allow anyone to slap anyone on the wrist i would be a human shield for joe and the, and the people but no they do they do remarkably well and as i said it's come from years of experience which we have in our team thank you um, well uh sonny did you have anything else to add to that um, otherwise just, we should just, move just, on yeah. yeah we just just one more um i think the next question i was supposed to ask was around how we collaborate with other departments within um hcc more effectively, but I think we've actually probably covered we've, that we've in the last that, few I think. Yes. But I just wanted to ask one very, one very, very quick one, if I might, and it's more to be under, to understand about with regards to the funding that we get and the commissioning that we do, do we have a framework? Now, general practice has to provide something called COAFs, which is quality outcome uh, framework. And depending on how they deliver that, they get their money accordingly. Do we have something similar or anything like that within public health? Sure. No, no, I mean, David might may correct me but on this one, but I, I, I don't think that we do not in, in terms of the funding that we get. We don't have to um, we don't have to um, provide that. Um, yeah, no, we, we just uh, we, we yeah, we don't we, we do whatever we do, what we set out to do in our plan and then we monitor the outcomes, as we mentioned earlier, against those public health outcomes framework. OK, thank you. Then let's move on. Thank you for that. Let's move on to our fifth line in, of, of inquiry led by Richard Butler, asking questions around some of the staffing issues in public health. So, Richard, if you'd introduce yourself and then fire off your question. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah, I'm Richard Butler. I represent um, in the Borenwood South Division. Um, so I've got two questions here for you, Morris and team. Um, I'll just read it off how it is. I know Seamus touched on it earlier, but how does the service plan to combat the staffing issues 
which are affecting the public uh, sector. And also public health is one of those areas where there are key people with unique skill sets. How do we plan for the impact of an unexpected departure? I know you've already uh, mentioned earlier about um, outside outsourcing or outside organisations um, and hoping for a grant from government, but uh, also just looking at pages 120 to 121, on E115, there's efficiencies there, which then will come up to uh, a million pounds uh, in a few years time. So just uh, some in information around that would be great. Thank you. Very, very, very good questions. Um, and ones which I'm sure are the themes to many uh, of these sorts of um, scrutinies, not just here, but elsewhere at the moment, because we live in, in challenging times when it comes to staff. I mean, we're fortunate enough to have a full complement of staff at the moment in public health. Uh, we fully embrace flexible working and this is seen as a benefit to many staff and at a time where you've got not just um, wage inflation um, and the cost of living crisis and whatever you can and can't afford to pay staff others will be able to offer the similar amount so the more you can offer by way of um, additional benefits to want to keep your staff working with you the better so flexible um, uh, um, working is one of them we've also got a very good track record on training and developing our staff uh, which has been received po positively. During the pandemic, we uh, recruited a lot of staff, number of staff on full-time contracts. Uh, some of these have now uh, paid, paid, been made contract, uh, sorry, been made permanent, and we've been able to manage costs by generating income from the services that they can provide to external organisations and other uh, Harch County Council departments. So their posts and work they do can be offset by other uh, internal commissioning or external work they do outside and we expect that income to grow we're working on that specifically we train registrars uh, we operate a healthy uh, department culture that seems to encourage loyalty and highly motivated individuals and the result of the Harpsh County Council staff surveys have shown a very high degree of employee engagement year on year um, you did then ask me about how you we plan for departures uh, there are a shortage of public health consultants in the system generally across the country now, we play a role in developing staff for the future, and we've hosted and mentored many individuals on the PH, the Public Health Registrar Scheme. Some of our previous registrars have become consultants in public health, one of whom heads up our health improvement function, actually. Uh, we've also developed non-PH people, and one of our project managers has joined the Registrar Scheme, and another is becoming a consultant via the portfolio route. So one of our key aims uh, in public health is to integrate with our wider systems and involve our colleagues across the county council in delivering better health outcomes. We do this through schemes like the MECC by training frontline staff in motivating, uh, in motivational interviewing and by working with departmental leads to include aspects of health in their policies. It's something we understand. It's something we are ahead of the curve on, but we cannot take for granted because that could change very swiftly at any time. But we are as prepared as I think we can be and probably better prepared than some. Thank you. Richard, did Can you have I a just up? come back on that, Sandy, in the terms of, yep. well, just linking that with the efficiencies that you're saying around staffing as well. How does that all tie in? Because that all sounds great with obviously educating our own, bringing our own through the ranks and everything. But how are you going to make those efficiencies over the next few years? Well, we've got to remember that some of the um, services that we needed to provide came in during COVID. So they were very specific to certain types of work. Um, thankfully, much of that has now moved on. So we can potentially lose people that way. I hate phrasing losing people, but we can we can slim down that way without it affecting the overall service because we no longer need that service. So you can it's it's it, it Joe, is that right? And would you like to expand? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I think you're right. I mean, I think we anticipate that a, a lot of the, the the effort involved in the COVID work that, that is still continuing on will actually decrease over time. Hopefully, we you know we don't get another fresh wave or a new pandemic at any point in time. Um, but also the reduction in that um, those staffing salary costs um, is also down to the additional income that we anticipate being able to generate for, um, for for some of the services that we're able to provide. So that's that's quite a new area of work for us, actually generating that income, but we anticipate that that's going to increase year on year, which will obviously bring our net costs down. I see everyone else wants to come in on this, Sandy, so I will leave yes. it for them. <laughs> and just to say, I think we've actually said that we would like more information in future years on the income generation you hope to achieve. But I'm going to ask, John and Fiona have indicated interest in intervening. So first of all, John Hale. 
Uh, uh, thank you, Sandy. I, I'm getting a little bit confused here, and I suspect it might do to with how public health is funded and how you then staff up particular work streams by bringing people in on short term contracts. But I thought and I think it was Joe earlier said that we had a freeze on filling vacancies, which implies we have vacancies. But Morris just said we had a full complement of staff of officers. So which is it? Yeah, we, we have sufficient staff to deliver our priorities for the for the coming year at this point in time. Uh, that is after the vacancy freeze. So there are a number of areas that we were looking to expand into. Having put the vacancy freeze on, we've actually considered that we probably won't go down that route. And we have, um, as a result, we are looking to, uh, you know, continue on with the full complement of staff that we need to deliver against our service plans for the coming year. OK, so we were planning to increase our workforce to do more. We're now not going to increase our workforce, so we're going to do less than we'd hoped to do. But because we're going to do less, we have enough staff. So it's a bit like saying um, if, if the grant comes out as less, we'll not renew some of the short term contracts and we'll still have our full complement of staff because we're doing less than we were going to do. So we're just cutting our we're cutting our cloth to fit the funding we've got available. Absolutely, that exactly, yes. Thank you. And I've got Fiona. Thank you, Chairman. The question I had has already been answered. Uh, I've so got I one say no more on this. Okay. I've, I've got one final question, if I may just ask on this public health area, and that is, as I understand it, public health is entirely funded by the central government grant and there is no contribution from Hertfordshire County Council's own resources. Is that correct? That, that is correct, yeah. And we have we are only we only have access to the uh, to the ring fence grant and within that we have to absorb our own inflation and uh, demographic changes, which is quite challenging sometimes. So because Morris in his opening remarks for early on talked about sharing the pain of the budget cuts with the County Council, that seems to be a slightly false steer because we stand or fall on what the government gives us. And actually, Hertfordshire County Council is quite separate in terms of what the impact on its budget and what it is having to do. This is kind of a standalone area. I just want to clarify that, that, that we're not fighting. we're not making cuts because Hearts is having its budget cuts. The cuts are happening because of the public service grant. Is that don't right? forget, don't forget, Sandy, that, that the portfolio is not just public health; it's public health and community no, safety. Morris was talking about public health at the start. Which we, we and just to remind ourselves that whilst we get all the money for public health grant, we've been talking about how we generate income um, as a service, not from the government, in order to be able to meet the things that we need to be able to meet. So there is income that we generate from 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 some of our services I mentioned to you towards the end, Joe. Yeah, the, the the internal commissioning is our mechanism for helping HCC out. So unfortunately, it is it's kind of a one way arrangement. So if public health is struggling, we don't tend to get any money from the county council coffers. However, we regularly contribute through internal commissioning to pay for services that the county council would otherwise have to pay for. That's what internal commissioning does. Um, and in doing that, it means that county councils can reduce their budgets on, on the HCC side of things. And that's how we contribute to the HCC public, the, the, the HCC budget gap overall. That's very so, good. I just, I just wanted that clarification. I think at this point, we've come to the end of the public health section. I want to thank Joe and David for standing in so ably at short notice for Jim. Um, and you can sort of stand down now as we move you, into Joe. the you, community. Uh, yeah. Sandy, could yeah. we, be, we have a quick um, um, personal um, break, comfort break for two or three um, minutes? I'm perfectly happy if people, yes, we can hold just for two minutes. Can you manage in two minutes? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'll do my best. Yes, right. Well, if David's going for a comfort break, then maybe I shall then.
you're live, Chairman. Well, thank you very much. Welcome back to this um, um, IP um, evidence gathering session. And we're now moving to the community safety aspect of uh, Morris Bright's portfolio. I welcome Alex Woodman. Um, but first of all, I'm going to ask Morris to do an equally succinct summary of success, um, challenge and risk um, for the, the community safety side of his portfolio. Morris, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful and I shall do uh, the same so, as I did earlier. So um, HMR, HMI CFRS, the, his, his Majesty's now, His Majesty's Inspectorate for Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services. Uh, which recognises the progress that's been made in the service since the last inspection. Uh, colleagues may remember that um, inspectors came and visited us uh, in Hertfordshire early in 2022, it's almost a year now, to inspect the work of the Fire and Rescue Service under the three pillars of evaluation, effectiveness, efficiency and people. Uh, since the last report in 2018, I'm delighted to report that the service has moved from requires improvement in all three pillars to a good rating in two out of the three years of inspection. Uh, particularly in pleasing for me, um, as a person who came in in the last two years, and, and for Alex, I know who we took on uh, at, at the early part of the new administration, uh, is the inspector's acknowledgement of the progress which has been made in respect of our people, wherein three of the four subcategories were now judged to be good. This is a great achievement and a reward for all the hard work which has gone in by so many individuals and teams to address, address the issues flagged in their first inspection report of us uh, five years ago. Uh, yes, we still have further to go in evidencing efficiency and property, uh, properly looking after our people, but the report gives me encouragement, and I know officers too, that we're providing strong set evidence that the service is heading in the right direction. Remember what I always say, we run away from a fire, our firefighters run into one. Uh, and, you know, we need to make sure we're looking after our people. And it seems that the inspectorate believe that we are. So the challenge is to making our workplaces fit for the future. I note the comments in the HMI reports that in holding the mirror up and reporting our own acknowledgements that some of our buildings, I'm quoting, aren't fit for purpose and struggle to meet equalities, standards, facilities for female fighters at some locations just aren't suitable. Um, so providing a suitable working environment in which all our staff can work wash and properly rest remains a challenge. Although improving these workplace constitutes an important part of the element of next year's capital programme where there will be a particular focus on improving showering arrangements and rest facilities, we know we have to go further to go in this endeavour for us to be truly inclusive and provide an environment where both male and female firefighters are properly looked after at work. Changes to our estate, notably with the development of the Longfield hub that we're going to call it, comprising uh, an HQ, a new training centre and workshops are also aimed at developing and delivering quality work environments which enable the service to work more efficiently and to provide our staff with the quality, with the quality facilities they deserve. Risk, uh, well, cultural review into the fire brigade, you will have read all about it, London Fire Brigade that is, the report also makes it clear that whilst London was the focus of investigation, there was every possibility of poor practice happening in other fire services elsewhere in the country. And though the inspectors for the most part uh, speak positively about the cultures and behaviours they found within the Harpster Fire and Rescue Service, we take the London Fire Brigade Cultural Review Report extremely seriously and officers will be take, looking closely at each of the report's 23 recommendations for improvement to consider how these might apply to our own service and then take the necessary management action should this be required. That work has already begun. You've probably covered a lot there. I think we should move on to questions, actually. It's unless there's something gonna, quickly you I want to add. Well, I was. I had four lines. I was going to say something nice about Alex Woodman, but I don't need to. So sorry, Alex. Your compliments will have to come elsewhere. Now, I was just literally going to say that a lot of these actions have now been started. Alex and this entire senior leadership team are driving forward culture change um, so that if we are falling short of any high standards, um, that we make sure that they're embodied in the National Fire Chiefs Council Code of Ethics and in our authority's own values moving forward. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, thank you, Morris. Um, and it's interesting, whereas the first half of this session on public health, it was all revenue questions. The questions we have in this half yeah. are around the capital budget or largely around the capital budget. And we begin with capital funding and I'm having a fail as chair because I can't remember whether Terry Hone or John Hale was leading on this. Um, can one of you wave? It was Terry, you. Yeah. 
it was John going to take it, yeah. John, yeah. Back then. John, then yeah. John. I was, I was going John, to take. John. I was going to take it, except for the bit to do with the Jessa, the uh, right. far training session thing. John, um, over to you, John. Yes. And um, yeah, I'm looking at the, the various capital projects, and in particular, looking at page uh, one two five which shows how the funding has been moved a bit. Now, as in the questions, I think there is, and my apologies, Morris will slightly run about thing, is we've got some steep declines in the capital spend schemes a few years out, but we've also got quite a bit of reprogramming that's occurred. And I think the, the question that at the bottom of this is, have we pushed capital expenditure backwards because of delays in planning, getting um, permission, developing our schemes, or are we pushing it back because of funding constraints? OK, it's a good question. So the steep, steep, decline, steep decline, why? I'll, I'll take you through it and then if Alex has got anything to add. Look, yeah. the requirement for us to up reduce our overall capital spend has meant that each director, as you know, has had to trim down their own capital budget. We are no exception in community protection. Officers have revisited the capital program and 12 million pounds has returned to the corporate centre. Nevertheless, uh, revising our requirements and introducing new ways of meeting service needs has meant that we think that we can have close to what we're already looking for, but at a much reduced cost, notably by combining the headquarters project with that of a new training centre and technical workshops on the one site at the Jessa, the current uh, Stevenage location. Uh, for fire stations improvement, though, this is only phase one, and next year's IP may well see the investment continued into future years. And However, until we do the necessary analysis and support of new community risk management plan to properly understand risk and set out clearly how we'll res uh, resource our response prevention and, and protection activity to address those risks, it's too early to say what other opportunities, opportunities might be identified to make use of the existing fire stations and the new location which improve the fire cover. Alex, did you want to add anything to that? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, Alex Robinson, so I'm the Exec Director for Community Protection and Chief Fire Officer. I, I think the, the point what I pick up, Councillor Bright, is obviously from the early conversations. Uh, I know, Councillor Howell, you and I have, have discussed this. Uh, one of the areas that I was asked to consider was around the capital expenditure for the Longfield site programme. What we did was work with colleagues in corporate property to start aligning some of our thinking. And I think one of our areas of, of concern is that we'd ended up with probably three standalone programmes. One was around the investiture in our fire stations. One was the future of what we would do with Longfield's site to ensure that we had the right training facilities for firefighters. And then there was the query around the Hartford site, the future of HQ and how we would operate. We've had the opportunity to review that. Doing so, we've also looked at making best use of the corporate estate across the county. As we know, we are a, a significant landholder and we've assured ourselves that actually using the Longfield site is best for the portfolio. We have looked at the range of options that we needed. And as Councillor Bright has said, we made decisions to not uh, redevelop the Hartford site to the extent that it was once used. We would consolidate and look at opportunities up at Longfield. The other principles that we put into the programme is that we've made it a, uh, uh, the design and layout will be one that will future proof the use of that facility. So we are getting best use of the money in, in the first phase to make sure that we've delivered the dirty fire training facilities to make sure that firefighters are suitably trained. We will have a headquarter function there, but in turn, as we then expand and as we develop over the forthcoming years, we will be able to go back into the IP program should we have any needs that develop at that phase. And also at the same time, what we have been able to do is to get some significant uh, capital inject into the work that we're going to do on our fire stations, which, as Councillor Bright has said, is a, is a key priority for us. Uh, Sandy, before Terry comes in, yes. because I'm sure, can I just ask on the digital services capital programme, where we're looking to spend just over two million this year, that's quite significant up from what was proposed we'd be spending this year last year. Is that because expenditure has been delayed or are we actually looking to do more? And then I'll hand over to Terry. Do you want me to take this, Councillor Bright? On oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Consequently, of the one you'd asked, yeah. 
So th this is specifically, John, around the work that we'll be doing with the wider uh, control room function. So this is bringing forward and, and the timely point around when we're moving into the new contract. So that's why there's an increased spend at this point, because we are at that contract change as we move into the new mobilising system and how we utilise that part of the budget. So it's, it's a timing piece as opposed to any variation or, or sudden inject in, in cash. It's, it's alignment with the contract. OK, thanks. Terry is wants to intervene at this point, not unsurprisingly. Yeah, if I may, I'm, I'm perhaps I'll probably wander into the next item, the new training centre as well sometime. A few questions if I can, please. Uh, mentioned there the Hartford site. I thought the Hartford site we have pulled out of there. I thought that it was being redeveloped completely. Um, and that certainly HQ had gone from there and that the fire, fire appliances were going from there and it redeveloped for housing. And so perhaps you might want to comment on whether that is the current status that's changed. Secondly, um, the vehicles that we're procuring, are they smaller vehicles? Are they, in other words, not the big vehicles, but smaller ones? And any, are, are any of them perhaps electric or geared up to be electric or any other uh, sustainable um, product rather than petrol or diesel? And uh, finally, I will ask questions about the uh, Jester site, which I guess I'll have to change its name, but I'll come on to that after you answer the first two, if I can, please. Well, Alex, you better take the details for those. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Bright. So uh, the background, Councillor Home, the around the Hartford site, uh, as you know, we we decanted from there with the headquarter facility because the building had passed its life cycle. The plan was always to be to redevelop the lower part of that facility, so a fire station would still exist. So as, as you've said, the pumps, the appliances, they would still be on that location. We would still have uh, a facility there for the ambulance service, so it would still operate as an operational fire station. The element that was up for discussion was around the uh, the value of the site. So the rear of the site has quite a significant yard area and then how it will be developed above. Uh, I don't know what the latest decision is with working with developers and others because we've um, what we've worked through with corporate property is we've confirmed that our requirement will be for a fully operational fire station. So there will be no change to operational cover from Hartford. What we have confirmed with corporate property is that we do not require anything above that site for what would be the headquarter facility. There was a conversation previously about uh, other use of the estate, uh, some of the use of the county hall site. So this is all about maximising our corporate footprint, basically, and where we feel that we would be best placed for community protection is having the Longfield hub site where we consolidate everything there. So I think it will be uh, commercial decisions through corporate. I, I can come back to you in writing, Councillor Hone, if, if useful around colleagues with, with corporate property on any of the future decisions. I'm not aware that a final decision has been made on anything to do with uh, development on the site, but what I uh, can confirm is that obviously we will be doing the fire station, so there will be no change to the operational delivery that comes from that site. Uh, your second question, forgive me, sorry, it's just slipped my mind. What the vehicles. Sustainable, sustainability. Vehicles, vehicles. sorry, yeah. sustainability of vehicles. So um, we did procure uh, one slightly smaller fire engine, if I call it that way, that we would be using as part of a trial. The usual procurement program that's referenced in there is for um, the standard fire engine that you would all be familiar with, the, the normal equipment that goes out. What we have done is just look at the cycle of replacement where we've managed to make those savings by replacing three appliances. That still keeps us within the 15 year life cycle that we've agreed. We're confident that won't diminish any of our operational capabilities. On the sustainability point, uh, the uh, the costs at the moment for EV fire engines are significantly high. This this is an area of development. We have explored it. Uh, so Mark Barber, who's our Assistant Chief Fire Officer, who's responsible for this area, has been working with some of the companies and doing some exploratory work. We did have some internal conversations around it through Sustainability Board, but felt at the moment the costs for one of those appliances are so high at this time, it wouldn't be an efficient use of that capital, but it's absolutely something that we will be exploring as the technology <coughs> develops. What we are doing, though, is to make sure that all of the equipment that we have on our appliances is this is where we're using, you know, the use of lithium ion batteries as that um, technology is advanced. We are moving to uh, electric use, cutting equipment, things like that to reduce the impact on any diesel fuels. 
We do though across the, our wider fleet, our, our flexi duty officer fleet, we use our gas to liquid fuel. So we have changed the fuel that we use in all of our appliances so that it's more sustainable and environmentally friendly. So any opportunity we have to make our fleet more uh, sustainable, we are exploring. And as I said, as soon as that technology develops, then absolutely something we would be keen to be at the forefront of. Thank you very much indeed for those responses. Appreciate it uh, around that. Um, if I can move on with your permission, Sandy. Yes, totally. To talk about the yeah. Jessa. And really, I should have introduced myself, Councillor Terry Hone, Lechford South. Um, the Jessa, not so long ago, was going to be a joint facility with uh, the police um, service. Do I get the impression now that that, because of what I read here, has fallen away from a financial perspective and nothing else? They were going to put some funds in there, hopefully, but from look at, well, looking at the budget now, I don't can't see that they are going to continue that. And therefore, have we, and by the fact you also say you're going to move the headquarters to the Jessa, which means you're going to move out of, uh, well, of the um, Stanbury Lakes. You personally move out of Stanbury Lakes and move your HQ people, staff team to where the uh, rest of the team are. Which is up at uh, Jessa. That's uh, certainly the response team, uh, the um, phone response, yes, team are there. So it's are those two things happening? In other words, the police is not going to happen, and you're going to move from uh, from Stanbury Lakes to uh, to Stevenage sometime. Well, may I just quickly I'll, I'll, may I quickly intervene before the answer is given and just explain for those listening who may wonder what who Jessa is. Yeah. It's the acronym for what was going to be the Joint Emergency Services Academy. And Terry is asking whether what the implications are of the police pulling out of that and stopping the joint bit. Anyway, back Thank to you, Sandy, Alex I'll, Morris. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the first bit and then I'll ask Alex to, to join us. Yes, anyone anyway, thought it was a, an elderly aunt, Auntie Jess, and no, it's not. Um, thank you for that. Yes, look, from a financial perspective, uh, very little um, has changed given that uh, the police will uh, have been expected to meet the costs originally. So how does it affect us? They were going to meet the costs for their specific needs. Uh, inevitably, some smaller costs and shared services, such as the toilets and the canteen, will now not happen. But this is not going to be significant uh, in the overall scale of the project. In this instance, both the police and ourselves believe that theirs and our own respective organisational needs could be served by doing things separately. And we have had those conversations quite a few. Uh, from a collaboration perspective, we, of course, remain committed to working closely, as we always have done with colleagues from the constabulary, and we continue to do so on a daily basis. And the HMI CFRS acknowledged in their report that our close working relationship with the police and the strength of our wider partnership and arrangements was something that they were very pleased with. So although the police are using the Longfield site less, we've just agreed a new arrangement with the British Transport Police to make use of some of our office accommodation, bringing in some well, uh, welcome additional income. It's important to note also that we are collaborating on other estate projects, such as the multi-agency hub at Brookfield Farm, uh, and we're actively exploring similar opportunities elsewhere in the country. And subject to Cabinet's approval of the detailed business case, it's expected that work would start in this next financial year on the establishment of a new main hub for the service, hosting our training headquarters, fire control and technical services functions. So there's some impressive stuff going on. Alex, did you have anything to add? Thank you, Councillor Bright. I, I think you, you've covered all of the, the key areas. I, I think probably Councillor Home, what I'd just reiterate is the fact that there, there is a you know a constant and regular dialogue with senior police colleagues. We, we are all making decisions around the, the future of our state and the best use of our facilities. Um, you'll be aware there is um, some significant investment going on up at the police site, up at Stanborough. Um, I know when I speak to Charlie Hall as the Chief Constable, you know, they have a future vision for that location. There is a, uh, there is not a, how can I word it? We've not closed doors on, on anything. This is this is not us stopping anything happening. It's more about the, the best use of our collective estates. Um, the facilities that were being proposed to be used at Longfield um, were of a benefit for police colleagues. They, they, we've not lost any joint training facility. Some of the proposals they had up there for areas for around their officer safety training, the use of taser lounges and things like that. So they weren't necessarily uh, joint facilities where fire, police and ambulance would, would benefit. We, we haven't lost any of that. Um, the Longfield site will still continue to operate as a joint operational training facility. 
our, if I call it our dirty fire training element, is our focus to be built on the location. Um, so I'm confident from an operational delivery perspective that we haven't lost any opportunities. Um, but police colleagues and us have, have looked at our respective estates and found uh, you know, more efficient ways of delivering our, our models. Thank you for that. I, I guess back at, going back to the, the Jessa, um, does that include the uh, chamber, which I think was out of date some time ago? Um, the breathing apparatus chamber, the BA chamber. Th that's that is the specific area of our focus for redevelopment. So the the bit that I've referred to, Councillor Holmes, the dirty training uh, facility. That's exactly the bit that we've prioritised about rebuilding, and, and that's where we're focusing because that's all about firefighter safety. So where we've looked to maximise uh, the capital expenditure that we've got has all been about investing in our front line. So I'm absolutely confident that what will be delivered on that site will be a modern fit for the future live fire training facility that will absolutely keep or you know aid in training and keeping our firefighters safe. That's where the priority of spend has been. What we've stripped away and considered is, is any other the functions that we've got and how we extend the life of the current buildings that are on that location. Thanks Hope, very much indeed. Uh, John, and I'm conscious of time, but John, you wanted to intervene. Yeah. Um, last year we had, I think, 34 million in the budget for the development of this facility of which five million was going to come from the county council so that would have meant that we were looking to spend about 28 million on the county side on this once we've taken into account the million or so that we were due to spend in the current financial year so we were looking at a project going forward from now of about 28 million. It's now scaled down to 17 million and we know construction costs have been a lot higher than we would have been forecasting a year ago. So that 17 million is going to get us less than the 17 million a year ago would have thought. Are we confident that you haven't? I, I, I'm assuming we weren't going to build facilities for the police out of our budget. So are we confident that the scaled down back um, training facility is going to be adequate for what you need, given that we've halved the budget? Alex. So I think predominantly yes, Councillor Howell, that's what we're focused on. The The area that we've prioritised has been around the dirty fire training facility. Some of the proposals in the other scheme was around uh, upgrading some of the buildings that are towards the end of life cycle. So what we've done is move to a more phased approach to the programme. There are, you know, I think we all accept on a public estate, there is there's always significant works that we can do. There's always changes, but what we've done is re profile the project to focus on live fire training to give us the facilities that we feel that we need that ensure that we are fit for the future but there are no doubt dialogue that we will be having over the next five to ten years around how we would be looking at long-term investment but at the moment we recognize like all other council directorates that there's been significant financial pressures put on the county and, and we have cut our cloth accordingly and we've reprioritized and focused on frontline services and then we put ourselves in a position to extend the life cycle of some of the facilities around office space that we've used that we would not look to modernize in phase one but what we have been keen to do and speak through the corporate property and the architects is to make sure that that site is designed in such a way so that we haven't missed any opportunities so for argument's sake that the bottom end of the site will all be focused on live fire training that that will be that will stay that's fit for the future that will not need to change what we have looked at is the layout of the rest of the site to make sure that any works that we do now would be complementary to anything that might be achievable in the future and we don't miss any opportunities or you know score any classic own goals by missing an opportunity at this stage so I, i'm confident where we're at the minute and i'm confident that we can focus on delivering that live fire training facility and move our headquarters up there and okay, the ability that we would rent out, rent out to other people to come and use as well to bring some income revenue income I've, I've got one quick last question before we move on to staffing and that is just that we have been told or some of us have been told that the county has not yet identified all of the cuts in capital projects which may be required to keep the interest payments to the level the flat level that they're hoping to achieve in revenue terms. So what are the vulnerabilities in the fire and community safety service area, which might, you know, what are you planning for just in case you're asked to say, sorry, you can't spend that capital money because we can't afford the 
revenue budget or the interest? Is that something that's a worry? And have you got contingencies for that? Do you want me to take that case? Yeah. Um, so I think we, we are alive to the fact that there is an ever changing financial position globally that's having an impact on, on uh, budgets. At the moment, there is no live dialogue that I'm having with colleagues in finance or our director of finance regarding specific programmes within the fire rescue portfolio. Um, I am confident from the discussions that we've had, and, and you'll be aware that uh, uh, I mean, Mapley has led some extensive discussions across the, uh, the executive leadership board around our approach to IP and finance, and that gave us a real strong opportunity with cabinet colleagues to identify and prioritise our programmes. My view is that I'm confident that we've been able to position the demand and need for fire and rescue, that that's recognised across the executive team and cabinet, that these are priority programmes. So there's, there is no live conversation chair that I'm having at the moment regarding any of our estate. Um, I think it'd be impossible for me to give you an answer off the cuff around what we will do. But I think what I've said is, is that we've put all of our programmes as scalable options. Um, and, and if that dialogue needed to take place with colleagues, we would look at it again and, and, and review our position. But uh, I'm, I'm confident that's not the position that would be asked of me with the current projects that we've put forward because the priority they've been identified as. Thank you. That's very, very helpful. Um, we now move to our last um, P line of inquiry in this session, and it's for Richard Thake, and it's about the staffing issues that are in this area. Richard. Thank you. Um, Morris, in your sort of preliminary on this particular segment of your portfolio, you very kindly brought us up to speed on the recent London Fire Service report and the fact that there are actions in hand in Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue to uh, to look into those issues and to, to take any corrective actions that we believe uh, are necessary to ensure that, that, that we meet those cultural issues. Are you happy that the budget that you've got uh, contained is going to meet those or, are, or are, is there a possibility that, that, that some of those alterations, physical alterations on uh, to our build programme, which might prove necessary, uh, will have to wait? Or have you got enough, do you think? But are you just relating to staff or, or build? Well, no, this is, uh, I'm, 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 I'm alluding to the fact that, that in your introduction, you, you partly addressed a question that I was scheduled to ask, namely uh, the cultural issues and, uh, and the recent London Fire Service yes, report no. and the fact that, that you said, I believe, that, that, that uh, you'd already taken this on board and that in, in the programmes that, that, that we are uh, conducting, it includes investigations into what uh, uh, physical alterations you might need to adjust dresses and, and whatever training you know. essentially you answer you answer the question Mike my, my question is if since since this is uh, this work has only just started it's possible that, that from that might come physical requirements on our built estate or for that matter staff training on our, uh, to, 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 to address these things and are you satisfied that there is sufficient budget in hand to meet those contingencies as they are yet to be fully e explored. Uh, I, I will partly answer this and I'll partly answer it as well. It's Alex and he um, came to Hertfordshire 18 months ago, maybe slightly more. One of the first things he did was go out and start looking at the estate uh, and the state some of it is in and started putting together plans and putting in actions and putting in business cases and costs for what's going to be done. Um, so we're quite far down the line um, in that particular area and it would be remiss of anyone to say well you can't now do that work A because it needs to be done for the sake of the staff and B because we've been um, well approved by government inspectors for the way that we're treating our staff it would be perverse not to um, but just to give the, the reassurance about what the implications are of that and to ensure that it is happening Alex I'm happy to hand over to you. And if you can be quite brief, because Fiona wants to come in and we're coming towards the end of the session, but Alex is briefly. Absolutely. So I, I think directly to your point, Councillor Thake, is that yes, I'm happy year one that the money that's been apportioned, we're looking at around three million pounds of uh, investments going to those stations. Both Councillor Bright and Councillor Ranger have been you know, very clear with me as well about their expectations of what they want to see happen in the delivery programme here. So this is a this is a start of a journey. I, I have to be realistic in the fact that um, what we can achieve in year and the pace that we can move through this, 
this is part of an ongoing development program. I think it's a very positive sign that there's this significant capital investment in year one, but we will be working with corporate property now through the forthcoming years to ensure that our estate meets the needs of, of all of our service. Right. Um, Chairman, I'm not entirely sure whether Fiona and Sonny uh, are, are trying to um, dig deeper into this particular segment of, of my two questions. Um, I, I leave it to your decision. I can either ask my uh, first question, which which I'm now going to ask second, or allow those to come in if they want to go deeper. And your, your call, sir. Um, I think I might invite Fiona to chip in here because she did express interest in this at the previous pre-meeting and I suspect she wants to ask about apprentices. So Fiona, over to you and then Sunny also has indicated an interest, but Fiona. Yes, I. that is the road that I'm going down. So I don't know if you want to get the questions about capital investment out of the way first no, no, before you, no, Fiona, you go into no, this. No, no, Fiona, you far in. We're getting yeah. close to the end of time. I think it's an important question you're asking. Indeed, it's really related to appre apprentices. And that is, what, what are we doing as an authority to promote firefighting as a career? And is there funding for that? And there's references to apprentice, apprenticeships, but the apprenticeships are no good unless we've got the apprentices to fill them. So what are we doing to promote firefighting as a career to people? Yeah, hugely, hugely important question, because if we are to fill gaps that we have in staff and that everyone has, you've got to get people in and anyway, get them in is to give them a taste of what it's going to be like. You don't get a firefighter overnight, like you don't get a doctor overnight. So it's we have to get in there quick. And our apprentice scheme um, has been hugely important. Uh, not just in providing a very cost efficient model, uh, enabling us to draw down on the apprenticeship levy funding, but also in supporting high quality training. And the proof of that uh, is that Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue Services upheld 100% apprenticeship pass rate, with a further 65 apprentices um, successfully completing the endpoint assessment um, started um, since 2021. This achievement means that the Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue remains one of only one of the only firefighting rescue services in the country to have 100% rate success in apprenticeships. Our scheme also provides future firefighters confidence if they do join the fire and rescue service, they will be a beneficiary of a best in class training program to help them launch their careers in, in the fire service. So it's a hugely important part. It's something we take very, very seriously. Joe, no, you're on mute. Thank you, Morris. It's good that the pass rate is so good, but what are we doing to encourage people to join the course in the first place? Right, so how are we getting the message out there? Alex? So uh, I think there's, there's one other point, if I may, Councillor Guest, as well. About, I think you ask around, you know, every apprenticeship will translate into a role in fire service. That's the way we do our mapping and modelling. We don't overload apprenticeship places without them having jobs available. So they will all they will all translate into a full time role within the fire service. Um, promotion, retention, recruitment is a, an area of challenge because we are seeing a reduction in the interest in people wishing to join the fire service. I think, you know, some years ago we'd up to we'd have up to something like you know, 5000 applicants for a job. You know, people would queue around the road and, and we didn't have to go out of our way to attract. Um, we are looking at the way that we do engagement. We're looking at that on a number of factors because we want to ensure that we're reaching out across all of our communities, that we make sure that the fire service is attractive to all. We're also looking at the type of image that is promoted around joining the fire service, that we make sure that people understand the wider roles within prevention, within protection, the wider skill sets that we need across the organisation and the word that I use regularly around us being fit for the future. So we look at a number of uh, methods. We are looking at the imagery that we're using. We're looking at the language we're using. We're looking at the social media forums, all of the touch points to make sure that we are attractive to our new generation coming through to join the service because as we know there are uh, changes through generations around what attracts um, and what you know what works into recruitment so we are looking at that we're alive to it we're working with comms and we're looking at far more levels of engagement um i don't have a perfect solution we are still seeing a reduction in people's interest um but I don't think it's out of kilter for Hertfordshire with what I'm hearing across speaking with National Fire Chiefs colleagues around it. This is a challenge for the sector. Um, do I think it's directly linked and attributable with some of the more recent headlines? 
Um, I don't think the headlines have been in existence long enough for that to translate it through, but it's certainly something that I'm concerned over in how I demonstrate to the community that people want to be attracted to Hertfordshire. Um, so we are we are open to as many routes as possible. We are looking at more targeted recruitment campaigns, specifically within uh, certain areas and certain communities to make sure that we are open for all. Um, but it is something that I think as a sector, we are all looking at at the moment because we are seeing this dip in interest across national levels. And very briefly, Thank you. I, I, I think we are at the witching hour, I'm afraid. That's some, I've got some figures for you, Mr Chairman, which I yeah. hope we'll finish on a positive note. Um, very briefly. We, Oh, well, look, we continue to recruit regularly. We've got 26 new firefighters that passed out in December and have now moved on to fire stations. And in April, this one will be a new squad of 24 starting uh, and another cohort plan for September. And I think if there's a successful pay settlement agreed nationally, um, I hope that will um, ensure recruitment and retention. So it's not all negative news. There's some very positive news in there as well. And I just thought it was worth flagging up at the end. On that note, I must give my apologies to Sunny, but Sunny, we are at the witching hour, so we have completed our hour and a half session. Um, I want to thank Morris and Alex for their answers. I want to thank all my colleagues on this scrutiny for what's been quite a forensic exercise this morning, and I think very valuable both for us, but I hope for Morris and Alex yeah. as well. We now pause for 20 minutes and we reconvene at 12.20. To, sorry, uh, am I right there? It's um. Uh, anyway, we reconvene whenever we reconvene. Sorry, I've um, I've bubbled, lost the plot. Hi there, um, 11, it's 11, Joanna 15. from Scrutiny. 11, we convene, 15. reconvene at ten to. Ten to. My my apologies. Okay, see you all then. Thank you Thank all you very, very much. Thank you very much. Well, well, well done, Sandy, and uh, I'm. I'm
We're live again, Chairman. Um, thank you very much. Um, welcome back to my fellow members of this scrutiny um, panel. Um, we now need to discuss um, the recommendations or indeed any notes that we wish to um, send forward from this morning's session. Um, I can see Rena is there marking our homework. I'm not sure whether Morris is back on. Um, these are our recommendations. Artemis, I think, is going to read back some suggestions, some suggestions for us, but it is down to us to come up with our recommendations. And that's what I want to emphasize. This is not something that is steered from the center. But Artemis, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, you have been furiously writing while we've been having a relax in the intervening 20 minutes. Would you like to read out your suggestions? But can you do it slowly? Because I don't have shorthand. I don't know. My colleagues probably are highly skilled at that kind of thing, but I don't. But if you could read out what you think we should be or could be recommending. And then I will say to colleagues, of course, you can add or subtract whatever you wish. And I'm in your hands. But Artemis, first of all, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So good morning, everybody. Artemis Cassie, Head of Scrutiny. And I'd just like to say it's very much a joint effort with Joanna as well. So um, what I'd like to do is just very briefly uh, refer you back to some of the things that you discussed and then I'll go straight into the recommendations. So you heard some very positive things about successes in the winter campaigns and uh, the number of residents who've been referred to various programmes within Hertfordshire, including weight management, healthy hubs and being given support by the drugs and alcohol services. And sorry, just for clarity, I'm going to take public health first. I don't know if you'd like to do all the recommendations for um, the two uh, directorates or whether you'd like to separate it out, public health and um, community safety chair. I think do all for two because we then may need okay. to weed because we don't okay. want to. We all agree we did not want to do more than two or three max overall. So if we have to weed some, we will weed some. So I think let's do all of them. OK, you also uh, discussed uh, reductions in the staffing complement and um, explored income generation. Um, you heard about the behavioural change unit and the work of the evidence and intelligence team, how Hertfordshire's expertise is being purchased by the NHS and other external organisations, which is leading to income generation. Um, there was discussion about successful collaborative partnership working and the outcomes that that brings. Uh, there was also discussion about the data set from 2019 from the Office for Health Data and Disparities. Uh, members also discussed uh, highest spend and worst outcome. Uh, you also considered uh, clawback from the public health grant and uh, ring fenced funding. And uh, it was brought to our attention that £42 per head are spent on Hertfordshire residents due to the general good health of our residents compared to funding rates of £132 per head in Blackpool or £188 in the City of London. Um, uh, I'll go on to the community safety. You looked at the trimming of the capital budget and there was discussion of Longfield, Jessa, Hartford and the HQ. Uh, there was also discussion of how uh, the police and Hertfordshire have reviewed their needs and their estates and uh, this has arrived at slightly different outcomes than had been considered uh, at the previous IP. However, a new arrangement with the British Transport Police will generate income, so there are positives. We heard how the service continues to be forward-looking and future-proofing, and that includes continuing to monitor and explore delivery of sustainability, uh, for example, within the uh, appliances and doing pilots and uh, further future proofing, including the updating of the breathing facility at Jessa. Some positives, uh, Hertfordshire has the only 100% employment success for apprentices at national level, and there is a campaign to continue to attract applicants um, despite the national reduction in applications. Um, 
worth noting, Hertfordshire can offer every apprentice a full time role after completion of their apprenticeship. Now, in terms of recommendations, I read these uh, slowly, please. Read these so we can and write I will, them down. I will take yes. a breath and slow down here. Yes. So um, in terms of public health, one recommendation is about lobbying, lobbying, sorry, at central government level, um, in particular uh, for central government to take a long term approach to public health funding. This, the reason for this would be to allow stability and certainty for public health uh, programmes to embed. Let me know if you need me to go back over that at all. Are colleagues happy they've got that? Sorry, <clears throat> just slightly cut out there. Would you mind repeating that last bit again? So, uh, so a recommendation is for there to be lobbying at central government level about taking a long term approach to public health funding. This would allow stability and certainty in the public health programmes and allow those programmes to embed. If I, Chairman, if Thank I may you. make an observation, it no, was confirmed. Oh, uh, why, uh, why don't we get them all down and then we'll comment, Richard, actually. Let's, let's, yeah, let's, okay, let's get them all. Sorry, yes. my, apolo my yeah. apologies. Yeah, my apologies. So what's and the second one, Artemis? Uh, further recommendation, um, rather than looking at uh, national comparators, uh, for there to be more investigation of comparisons with Buckinghamshire, Bed Bedfordshire and Essex, as these are more directly relevant and directly comparable to the Hertfordshire context. Yeah, OK. And then uh, in terms of um, uh, still in public health, um, to take the learning from the impact of COVID, uh, with a view to future proofing for similar public health issues of that scale. And the suggestion is uh, for that to be a, a topic group, actually. OK, yep, uh, from yeah. COVID and I'd make it a cop. Yes, yes. And then in terms of actions, if I may. Um, so actions from public health uh, to ensure that uh, in the narrative of the I of the IP, um, staffing costs are clear that there are more details of any projected income and income generation. Sorry, I'll slow down, Chair. No, that's OK. And that's okay me, I've got that, yes. And that there is more narrative and analysis on monitoring and evaluation of outcomes. Uh, we have also noted that you would like a briefing note about the reduction in budget from 6.7 million to 5.5 million. And uh, as an action for the data from 2019, um, as I think you might recall, we talked about the data from the office for um, it was the it was the comparison data. It, yes, yes, the, uh, and it was the, the surprisingly uh, surprisingly uh, out of date. Four, yep. four years out of date, and so for that data to be um, updated, and then uh, with community safety, just one action um, for there to be a, a bulletin on the development of the Longfield and Hartford sites. So happy to be corrected and um, on any omissions or factual inaccuracies. Uh, well, first of all, I um, um, I know that Richard Fake wanted to say something on the first um, um, recommend, draft recommendation, which was about lobbying central government. So, Richard, did you want to comment on that? I've got a number yes, of people all intervening. Yes, I, I, I merely to observe that it was made quite clear following my question uh, that that uh, that was going on and has been going on. And I would hate to um, uh, for for officers and and uh, the the director to think that we hadn't acknowledged that it was. I think more that we support the continued lobbying would be yeah. the way I would hope we would put it. Because I don't, I, you know, I mean, the, the the man is doing all he can. We're acknowledging the fact that that that, 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 that those actions 
are absolutely what we expect and hope to see. I'm con I'm certainly content with that as chair, and I'm sure others will be because that is exactly what we said. Uh, do I see that John Hale is disagreeing? Yes. And John is a John. You're the next person on on my list to call to speak. So John, say why you disagree. Okay. I, uh... The reason I disagree is I agree Jim is doing all he can as president of the et cetera, et cetera, but his is a officer position. And I think we need to stress that we look to the executive members of the council to publicly lobby for this to happen and not just, oh, well, Jim McManus in his role as director of, um, of the president of the directors of public health is doing all he can to, to send messages to government that we need this done. I think we need to stay a stronger message. Um, this funding comes out on the middle of March every year for 12 months. It's just it's a broken system. Uh, I'm in the hands of the um, um, uh, we, we, we will hold that thought and I'm in the hands of the panel here as to how we take take that forward. Um, I think Morris was pretty firm about it, actually. So I think Morris actually certainly emotionally is on the same page as you are, John, because that was clearly the the tenor of yeah. his um, remarks and his response. So I think it is an open door as far as he is concerned. Yeah, um, I think it's the, for the council to, to yes. To council yes. Them. Uh, the, yeah. the reason I raised my hand was on the question about data and it being four years old. That's the data that the central government is providing. So I think if we've got a comment on their recommend, whether it's a recommendation or action, it is that the council looks for sources of data that is more up to date, um, because unless the statistics get updated rapidly centrally, they're always going to be three or four years out of date. It's just the way those things, those oper organisations operate as, in my experience. A fair point. I think that Artemis can capture that. Um, Terry is next. Terry. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I guess I guess it's to Artemis. When she read what she'd heard about the comparison of uh, funding by regions, districts, areas and such like, she said that it was £188 for the City of London. I thought it was for London. No, it was, city the city of, it was the City of London, quite specifically said. I, I'm surprised that would be I know. What London is. It is astonishing, isn't it? It was the city of London, so it's all those little, you know, it's the shard and stuff, not the shard. I know but, the city know, of London is, yeah. The gherkin. The information yep. which is probably more relevant would be what it was for London as a whole. Yes. Uh, John. That, that, John, that, you have, people have to remember that the city of London is full of wealthy people, but they don't live there. Yes. The people who live in the city of London, if you've ever worked there for if you go down the back streets, etc., yes. there is a lot of quite old council housing so the resident a lot of the residents of the city of london are actually quite deprived and that is what you know yes. you're living quite levels of high levels of deprivation especially on the eastern side of the city and that's why they have such a high level okay I mean, let's do hackney next then, shall we or walthamstow if Sorry. i may quickly i'm moving on Yes, if I may quickly comment there, I mean, Artemis has captured what Sunny said, which was um, um, beds, Barks and Essex. I think there's some kind of, we do have some comparator, there's some phrase, isn't there, that we we do um, align ourselves, Sunny, with some comparator um, councils. Now, forget what the actual word is, but that's what we should use, is it's, that language. Um, if I can help here, um, it's statistical neighbours. That's it, statistical neighbours. So that's who we should be asking for comparisons with. And I, I think that's a very, very good point, and we should be saying that. Whether that's a recommendation or just a note, I'm not sure. I think it might just be a note, frankly. Um, but if we move on, I've got um, Richard. Have you got your that one on my list? But is that an, an historic hand or? Richard, my, apolo my, my apologies. It is, but um, I, I I have to express concerns about. Um, any inference that the executive member might not have been conjoining in these lobbying issues. And if we can find a form of words that say that we support uh, the continuation of the lobbying, both at executive member level or, or, or political level and at officer level, I would be more than happy. But I, you know, I, I, yeah, I, no, and, and Mr. Hale has stuck his thumb up. So you've come up with the answer there. 
what a happy team we are. Right, so that we've we've resolved that one. I've got um, next is Sunny. I've got him in, in my list of order, rank order. So Sunny, you wanted to come in. Yes, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to make two points, if I could, um, with regards to um, the national comparator versus our local um, uh, our local um, surrounding authorities. Um, you know, you would probably have to add Cambridgeshire in that, but perhaps what we should really say is if we look at Hertfordshire in terms of where it stands on the deprivation scale, uh, which is actually quite low, it's not very deprived, and then compare other areas that are comparable in terms of deprivation, because that's how our funding is ultimately de determined. So perhaps you might say, um, so you know, Bedfordshire may actually be quite high on the deprivation scale, so it's not a great comparison that. It's got so loose, just a thought. Yes, yes. Yeah, so it might be a thought that um, maybe we compare like for like in terms of where we stand in terms of deprivation to other areas. Um, that might be a better one. Just a suggestion. Happy for members to uh, agree or disagree on that one. I, f I think Seamus has answered that, which is that there is an actual official phrase, statistical neighbours, which actually mm -hmm. means something. Um, and we use it quite a lot. I just couldn't capture the words in my head and Seamus saved me from my embarrassment. Mm -hmm. So I think if we say statistical neighbours, I think that deals precisely with the point that you're making. And then suddenly you had another. Yeah, yeah, there's one last one with regards to the funding. It's quite a complicated funding system with regards to public health because essentially what they're really doing is they're giving, like um, the county has statutory requirements to provide certain public health related thing work but they don't give it part of the overall package it comes through public health and as we know public health england doesn't technically exist anymore it's been superseded by another organization whose four letter acronym uh, passes me by at the moment i can't quite remember what it is and as a consequence the delay in that coming through is based purely on the nhs budget because it's a part of nhs england it's one of those um, arm's length bodies. Um, so again, happy that we say like, you know, we would encourage a timely, um, uh, a timely resolution to the funding, but the delay is because ultimately the, you have to wait for NHS England to get their yearly funding. And then from that, all the other arm's length bodies that it oversees, including the new Public Health England, then gets their funding, which is why it's so much more delayed. Um, so yeah, that was just a, a sort of a general comment on that. I don't think we need to capture that in any way, but it, ultimately I think that's what sometimes the answer comes back from central government, which is basically we give it to NHS England and then it's their problem to pass it on to you. Yeah, I mean, I think your expertise was very useful on this scrutiny panel and it's showing now, but yes, I don't think that's something for us. I mean, that's a bit of your very useful background knowledge, but I don't think it alters the recommendation that we're making. I've got... Artemis at, at number two, at number two. So Artemis. I just wanted to reassure members about um, the phrasing and uh, these will be captured and circulated to you. But I did have actually um, to support the um, uh, continued lobbying record. Sorry, I've got recognising um, previous lobbying at, of central government. Um, the recommendation is to support the continued lobbying by the officers and executive member, although I would change the order that I've written it in there. So some phrasing around that, but um, we will take it away and work on it and circulate it. We've made notes of what you've said. Right, thank you. And um, Fiona. Thank you, Chairman. And as has been highlighted, Morris is very on the ball about the funding situation the fact that we get the, the grant very late in the day and it is only for one year. So I would add to lobbying, lobbying in the most appropriate and effective ways because there's also the possibility of using bodies, working through bodies such as the County Council's Network and the Local Government Association. Yep, I'm, I'm content with that. Um, if I may, just as if nobody else has got their hand up, um, I've got two um, thoughts. One is, I mean, all we have is um, the suggestion on the fire service side, an update on the um, situation with the JESA. And do we think we should be saying more about the community safety side? But also I was 
really surprised by the answer to the first question, Seamus's first question, and the fact that how much of that was going to be done by shedding jobs in the public health area. And that was a bit of a, I mean, that was a left field thing because that did not come out through the papers. Seamus asked the question and out came that answer. And then when I poked further, assuming that the funding remains flat for the next four years, there will be continue to be um, job losses. And then John Hale, I think, encapsulated it by saying that essentially they were saying that they were sufficiently staffed because they basically were cutting their ambitions. And it was this cutting cutting our cloth to fit the budget. And yeah, I think Sandy, there is something yeah. that we should tease out of that because I was I think, really quite shocked by that. I think, Sandy, the way I would look at it is was more of not that there was any, uh, that it was, it was opaque. Yes, that's that. That was it. That 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 there was definitely a staffing um, reduction or, or whatever over a period of time, uh, and it wasn't shown in in any of the uh, reports or any of the d indications there, uh, and it was just opaque. And I think it's just a question of, I don't know how you then you know when when you need to be a bit more clear as to how these these reductions are going to unfold and the consequences of them in the future. And I don't know how you're going to phrase that. Well, I think we just need to say that, you know, how, how, how we put it, but we, I mean, we, we, we should express our disappointment that we had to tease this out. Well, it's and not a really, disappointment. Yes. It's, it's, well, it's I, just I, no, a... I'm disappointed. I, mean, I was astonished. I mean, I will tell you, well, I did not expect that answer. I mean, there are going to be all sorts of other answers. That was the one answer I didn't expect. I'm glad that we posed the question and that you posed the question. <laughs> yes. And it came out with an answer which was left field, frankly, and I, really yeah. quite significant because, you know, insofar as public health is so based on manpower, I mean, fundamentally, that's what you spend your money on is people to deliver these programmes. So if you've got fewer people, now, I know that yeah, they said it, to an extent it, it was post-COVID and yeah. therefore to an extent there was, but I still think that it would be helpful in future if we actually had that laid out clearly that we can do this because we're post-COVID or something. That would be a fair way of doing it. I'll, but I'll I, leave it I to really the officers was, try and capture yeah. the words. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but I am. But I think if you th could think about that yeah but i do think that as critical friends i think that's what we've done we've we've challenged them here and we've we've saw we saw we've seen something which is slightly opaque and we've picked up on it yeah yes which is which is the whole purpose of yes scrutiny yes it's not, it's not about score, it's, it, it isn't about scoring points it's no, about no, actually no. just making sure that stuff is clear and that we are clear richard you have your yeah, hand up yeah i, I it, it's on this point um I'm glad the question was asked and that you're quite right. There was opacity there because none of us saw the obvious answer. The answer yeah. that we got from memory and uh, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, was essentially there were two elements here. The first was that, that um, the staffing had been increased to deal with a specific, namely the COVID thing, and that it wasn't made clear and obvious that that that, that now that situation has changed we can reduce the level of staff and yes. still continue to deliver the main programs because it was a an exceptional one-off in essence and the second was the lack of clarity around the income generation which clearly was offsetting the revenue costs and the fact that, that the revenue projections going forward uh, show a straight line a flat line or even a diminishing line but there was no Co corresponding projections for income. Yeah. So I, th I, 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 I think, I think you're quite right. It, the, the, the opacity is around the fact that that it wasn't immediately o o obvious to the panel and to us scrutinising what the the intents uh, uh, around those figures were. So I think that's we need to capture that and make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. Mm. Artemis, can you come up with something which you then share with us when you do? Have you have you captured that? Because I'm not sure I can come up with instant words about that, but I think if you come up with an initial draft which you send to all of us and then we can knock it into shape. But I, I really feel quite strongly that that's an additional 
recommendation or something like that that I would like to see captured because I think that was the 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 big ticket item that we if you like um exposed uh, wrong word exposed but clarified in the officer did make sense. make it clear that they would take it on board but I think we need to yes. uh, we need to make sure that, that we we do <laughs> I think I think it's fair to say we teased it out of them Yes. I'd put it that yes. way rather than yes. exposed. Yes. No, exactly right, sir. I'm sorry if I said I wasn't. It, it, it wasn't the right yes. word, but yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm I know. Really, yeah. I'm really glad that we had that conversation. So no, we did. Yeah. I mean, I so basically there were three recommendations. One was around lobbying, and I think we've agreed the form of words for that. But as I say, we will get a draft before it goes up to overview and scrutiny. Um, there was the comparison with statistical neighbours um, and then you we've we, we've added this one on um, the personnel issues and need and the job cuts and the need for more clarity there and indeed income it's job cuts and income but more clarity around that particular budget line as to what that means and how they're um, 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 creating that. Uh, Artemis, you mentioned about um, having a topic group um, from, with the learning from COVID. From I mean, COVID, I suspect yeah. I, I, I don't quite recall that. And we we um, we have had topic groups on on learning from COVID. I mean, we've I mean, it's obviously it's a continuing story, but I wasn't quite sure that we did quite capture that. Do people share that with me, Sunny? Sunny? Yes. Um, yeah. No, no, we have. Um, not one in terms of COVID as a whole, but we have looked at um, the Bain area, uh, people, uh, Bain areas where COVID affected more and people who are more vulnerable to being affected by COVID uh, from a health and prosperity point of view. Um, and then that moved on to some other topic areas around uh, maternity care and so on and so forth. So there has been that. I don't think, but I don't think there's been an overarching one that looks at COVID. Yeah, no, I'm not anymore. I've, I've unmuted myself. Artemis, I think we can possibly take that one out. I I don't feel that we we um, had that. And I, and I can tell you that the OSC would turn around and say, no, we have to a degree boiled this ocean because I tried to push it and got rather rebuffed uh, quite separately from this. Um, but, but finally, we've got no recommendation as such about community safety. We've got um, the request for an update on what was the JESA and now is simply the ESA or whatever it is. Um, are we comfortable about not having, I've seen Richard has his hand up. So Richard. A apologies, San um, Sandy, that's a historic one and I a forgot one. to take okay. it down. But, uh, but, yeah, but are we comfortable about not having a recommendation on community safety? By the way, we don't have to. It's absolutely, I, you know, and if we feel that actually they answered the questions well and aren't, and dealt with what we raised well, then we stick with just this update on the yeah. ESA. Yeah, my take on it, Sandy, is that they did. Um, they stood up to the plate. You, 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 you asked them questions, uh, and they they came back and uh, answered them. Uh, I don't think there was anything there that they actually told us that we could actually put in a um, maybe in a, in a, in, a, in a scrutiny report. Maybe we should actually mention that we were satisfied with their with the response to the questioning. I wouldn't go as far as that. Bloody hell. Well, I it? would. No, no, we've got to because, of the, you know, we, we're critical friends. We've got to be positive as well. Uh, no, no, you know, just you know, honestly, heavens, good Lord. But, you know, what, what Morris won't be able to walk through a door. His head will be so big. So um, well, it's, um, yeah. anyway, we shall, yeah. we shall see what Artemis comes up with. Um, <laughs> Artemis can listen. I've I've got Fiona um, wanted to comment. Fiona. Thank you, Chairman. Surely the reason why we have a recommendation is because there's something that we need to recommend, mm. not just racking our brains to think of a recommendation for the sake of having a recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Thinking we've got to have a recommendation. Yeah, if we great. haven't got anything to recommend, then there's no point in having a recommendation. 
I, well, there we are. I mean, I think we're all we're all in violent agreement here. So Less Artemis, is more. Artemis, you captured that very well. And we will, yes, certainly ask for the update on the um, it, what was the JESA. And I can't think what it's called now. Is it called the ESA? Anyway, whatever. It's certainly not J. Um, but on that basis, we will get, I mean, Artemis will draft up what are somewhat incoherent ramblings and we'll send them back to all of us. Artemis, would you explain how that will work and the amount of time that we've got to come up with a finally agreed um, set of recommendations and notes? So, um, we'll do our best to get these out to you today. Um, and the reason why I say it like that is this this week we have the advantage of having fewer portfolios and fewer meetings. Um, but uh, we do actually need to get your draft recommendations in a format, if possible, so that we can submit them in a paper going forward to the OSC. So uh, we'll do it today and we'll try to give you as much time as possible without cutting into deadlines. So I will commit to getting it done uh, by close of play tonight. And then uh, if you can let us have your comments, but um, ideally, by uh, two o'clock tomorrow, please. And Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Uh, yes, just just about thinking about just some about. of my commitments. And I will, I'm afraid, exercise in the end um, chairman's um, yes. prerogative. If we end up not being agreed, then I will have to take <laughs> my best guess. But I will try and reflect the balance of the meeting. And for those listening externally, by the way, OSC, that's the overview and scrutiny um, committee, which is the body which is leading on this process. We're all acting here as subsets of that body. And what I can also assure colleagues is that it, it is an agreement of OSC that we do not seek to censor or amend the recommendations that have come up from the individual scrutiny groups. So what we agree will go forward to um, the cabinet um, at as part of the overall recommendation from OSC, which is being agreed on um, on February the 6th in the afternoon. We talk to the finance people in the morning and then it's cold towels round our heads and we do the final uh, discussion on the afternoon. But I just want to finally close and just say. Sandy, just a quickie yeah. for you. Yes. I see that uh, Elaine has put a message in the chat room saying that there's a COVID set, uh, step back uh, topic group yes. in November exactly. 2020. Yeah? Yes, there was. Okay. And I, I did recommend on OSC that we had a further one and got fairly re firmly re um, rebuffed, by the way, because I felt there was more to study. So I think we can hold the thought, but I didn't think it came out of our discussion as strongly um, as that. Um, and just to, uh, finally, I just want to say thank you to everybody because I thought it was a very useful and lucid discussion. And I think actually that in fact, Morris and Joe and David and Alex did very well as well. And they were largely brief and succinct. And um, that was good because I think certainly last year, Sharon Taylor was moved to actually comment in the chat uh, during the um, session that Morris was talking far too much. Um, which of course he can do, but I thought he was pretty good today and it's been a useful, a useful session. So I thank you all for your support and um, it's been very, very worthwhile. And thank sunny. you everybody. Goodbye. Sunny. I'd, I'd like to just uh, add to that. Thank you to all the officers and uh, actually a um, very good um, outline of all the work we've done, but particularly to uh, yourself, uh, Sandy. Um, haven't worked with opposition members very often, but I must say uh, this was a pleasure and thank you for your time and patience. Well, sir. Well, on that warm and cuddly note, um, we will. Bye, uh, Artemis. <laughs> yes. we, we, will, we will say goodbye, but uh, thank you all and um, Artemis, thank you. And we look forward to the results of your drafting. Thank you.